My name is Scott Joseph, and today I am talking with winning culture expert Sandy Cerami about the rules every business leader needs so they can understand and follow how to build a winning culture. So welcome, Sandy. Hey, thanks, Scott. I appreciate it, man. Good to be here. You are a well-known expert when it comes on to this subject of building a winning culture. Uh, he's graciously agreed to do this, this interview today, and he's going to share his extensive background and experience and knowledge and looking forward to this because I think every business leader uh, wants a, a better culture. Yeah. But sometimes we break the rules or don't know the <laughs> rules on how to how to build one. Sometimes there are no <laughs> rules, exactly. So thank you again for joining us on this interview. Let's jump right in. I'd like well, to I have to say this to you. It, yeah. it was easy to say yes, first of all, because you know the respect yeah. I have for you. But when you added bourbon to the mix <laughs> And we were going to the speakeasy at Evan Williams. They said, how could I say no? So thank you. I appreciate and, it. and they gave us a, a, a little tasting here as well. That's yeah, nice. Nothing wrong with that. Representative <laughs> up. No doubt. So I want the audience to get a better understanding of who you are, mm -hmm. right? Uh, where you're coming from, but more importantly, how you can relate to where they are right now. 100%. So I want to jump in with those and then we can kind of go more into the specifics of these rules on how to build a really sure. good winning culture. So could you tell us a little bit about yourself in terms of your background, your education, your experience in, in building winning sure. cultures? absolutely. Well, first of all, I'm a, uh, I guess a third generation car brat is the best way for me to put it. Um, I grew up, you know, in and around this business. Um, here I am 30, I think 31 years later, I still don't know how to change oil. I thought you were going to say 31 years old. Yeah, I wish. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> yeah, we'd all like to be, you know, able to go back in time. But uh, I grew up around this business and I loved the people uh, aspect of the business. I love the deal making piece of it. I still to this day cannot change oil, have trouble changing a tire. Uh, use the cell phone for most of those things, to be honest with you, or use clients to get that stuff done. But the, the piece that always intrigued me growing up and around the business was uh, the people, you know, inside and also the customers coming through the front door. So um, I grew up at the knee of the master, as they say, with my dad and my grandfather. Um, went to college. They couldn't take a joke at the University of Rhode Island, so they asked me to leave uh, prematurely. I know you and I both share that. I went uh, unwillingly and left college, you went willingly on your own. And I uh, realized it just wasn't for me and, and got into the business uh, at about 21 years of age and started selling cars um, when I was about 23. Uh, worked my way through all the chairs, spent time in the F&I box, et cetera. Uh, and up until about 2007, was having a great time in this business. Uh, and then, as you know, in 2007, we had kind of the wheels fall off uh, not just in the car business, but, you know, the, the uh, economy as a whole. Um, and we got to the point where we decided we were going to just put the key in the door in uh, 2008 and had a deal with General Motors to sell our store back to GM. Uh, and February of 2009, I got the phone call that they included that deal in the GM bankruptcy proceeding. So a little bit of a kick in the gut, but yeah. uh, picked ourselves up, my wife and I, my wife Mary, uh, saying hello to Mary because couldn't be here without her. Um, and I started a company called Applied Selling Dynamics because I knew that, that uh, what I had learned over the course of my first 20 years in the business was still applicable, just that I needed to go do it in a different way. So we reinvented ourselves. And what's great, and, and for the people outside of auto that are, that are listening, what's great about auto is it really has a diverse group of education and, yes, and uh, different training levels. No question about it. And sometimes non-existent. Correct. Yes. <laughs> and I've been in my share of, of stores over the last 10 years um, where I'm, I'm amazed at, at the lack of opportunity to learn and to grow and develop. And then I've been in some organizations where you see that that's a, a hallmark uh, of their culture. And uh, it's one of the things I recognized early on was critically important to sustainable success and growing profitability uh, in the kind of climate that we have today. You know, it's not easy to be a car dealer these days. No, it is not. And so clearly an expert in this area. You've built great teams. More importantly, I've seen what you've do, you do hands-on with mm -hmm. helping certain clients. We actually overlap a few clients. Yes, we do. Um, and the dealers that, or the clients that you work with, uh, I always pay a lot of attention when someone can take the same time, effort, and money and the same people. Mm-hmm and go from this type of level, right, a, a starting Absolutely. level, and take them up two to three levels higher. No question. I'll tell you, one of the clients, um, uh, Lexus of Route 10, uh, I know we've done work there. We've overlapped over the last 10 years or so. Uh, great example of, of that. Well, we went into an organization that was very well-known. It was the Warnock Automotive Group uh, prior to that. 
um, and uh, changed hands, you know, back in 2011. Uh, and the store was doing, you know, just just shy of about 200 new used cars a month at that point in time. Uh, new owner came in, um, had no automotive experience at all. Uh, I was actually referred to him by another client. And when he shared with me his vision of what he wanted to create um, with Celebrity Motorcars, his holding company, I was immediately intrigued. You know, it was, I was excited by it. It was a brand that I had not worked with, Lexus, previously. And... Um, First month in was December of 2011, and we did, uh, I believe it was 232 cars uh, in December of 2011. We had just had the keys handed uh, to the new owners. And over the course of the next five years, we grew that dealership to over 600 new and used cars. And, and see, that's something that translates. So there, there's not a dealer or general manager listening that wouldn't sit there and 100%. want to know how that was done. Yeah. Um, and what I want this to focus on is where your level of expertise, you're obviously outstanding in sales, um, but you really focus a lot of time on building the right culture. Yeah. And so what I want this to do is because there's a little, a lot of different ways to differentiate yourself. So, you know, every, di every business leader, or at least the ones that are in the commodity business are getting marginalized, right? No question about it. And so there are different ways to tackle that. Mm -hmm. And we've talked to a lot of people over the last few weeks and we've went through a lot of different uh, strategies and, and had a lot of great tips and suggestions. But I also, there's a, a common thread that's been going through all these. Mm -hmm. And that is about building their team and the culture. And that's one of the reasons I was excited to bring you on yeah. because I know your level of expertise when, in that area. What I want is I want the listening audience, mm -hmm. right? I want business leaders to be able to walk away from this episode with at least three rules. That if they follow, mm -hmm. right, it's almost as if they can't fail. 100%. That's what I want. So if, if there was one rule, all right, mm -hmm. what is your number one rule that business leaders need to follow to create a winning culture? Uh, first thing is that people matter more than anything else. Uh, you know, being very specific about who it is that you bring into your organization uh, do they um, line up and are they symmetrical with what you value as an organization? Uh, you need to have clarity with respect to what you value as an organization. I talk very often with dealer principals and GMs, and the first question I ask them is, give me two or three words that you want people to say after they've had an experience in your organization, whether it's an employee or a customer, or even a vendor for that matter. It really makes no difference to me, but you want to see some level of consistency in terms of what people are saying about your organization. Yeah. Are there any exceptions to that rule? None that I can think of. Um, you know, I, I think you had said something in the podcast that we shot uh, previously, and you said that you don't want culture to be forced. Correct. That you want it to kind of bubble up and emanate as a very organic um, characteristic of, of an organization. And I agree with that 100%. I think that um, great leadership will actually easily articulate and then help identify what their culture is all about. And it's not even something they have to say. It's something that people will see through action versus just words. One of the steps we like to start with is let's articulate what those actions really are yeah. so that people can identify and understand it. What are some of the things, What, in your experiences, when some of the rules that we're going to discuss, let's get specific to rule number one, right? People matter most. 100%. So finding the right people. What happens when you break that rule? What are the consequences that you've seen? It's a great question. Um, so we see it at epidemic levels in our business. And I understand why, because I was a victim of uh, my own frustration. I was a victim of my own uh, split decision making with respect to people. People, I would trust my gut uh, when I met somebody initially. Um, the, you know, we were fog and mirrors early on in our business. As business leaders, it's very difficult to it, you want everybody to succeed. Yes. And you believe deep down everyone is willing to do what it takes to succeed at a high level. And, and so it's almost like we sell ourselves yes. that everyone will be great mm -hmm. until. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's that classic trap door that we fall into. It's, uh, you know, I see a lot of times where we have guys that have or folks that have had tremendous success and they want to teach that, um, that long shot that long shot and give them a chance and have a great story to tell. The truth of the matter is, is that uh, we want to start with great people. Uh, we can certainly make room for a long shot here and there, mm -hmm. give somebody a chance that maybe hasn't had an opportunity previously, 
but ideally this should be an exclusionary process and we should be looking for people that uh, A, are good people to start with uh, and B, have an alignment with respect to what our values are. And so we, we break that rule in this business pretty often because we're desperate for folks to uh, help man our showroom floors. Um, and what I like to see is what I call a sticky culture in an organization where uh, there's a lot less recruiting and more fielding inquiries from the outside as to what opportunities may be available uh, you know, to them at your dealership. And that was going to lead into my next question is, you know, I personally, my opinion is I've never met anyone great at hiring. And the reason I say that is no matter what business leader I talk to, doesn't matter mm -hmm. what executive I'm talking to, they, they all seem to struggle in this area. And I, I see Fortune 500 companies. I see oh, yeah. mom and pop uh, businesses. Everyone's got a different way. Right, and everyone knows they struggle in this area, yep. so they all look at another way and say, "Well, let's try this." And I guess, what type of tools uh, or insight can you help people get the results? In other words, finding a higher percentage of people that are the right fit, right? Yeah, so to do it faster, easier, or more efficiently. So that's a great question. I think you know, building a profile, and I mean, really, literally, building a profile of the type of person that you want to hire and attract into your organization becomes a really smart piece of the puzzle for folks out there. And so I don't see very often dealerships or companies in general taking the time en masse to create that profile that says, this is the type of person that we're looking for. We're looking for somebody that has integrity. We're looking for somebody that has hunger, has a real desire to succeed. Somebody that's willing to uh, take orders before they're willing to give them or have the opportunity to give them. Somebody's willing to work on themselves harder than they work on anything else uh, in their career. Uh, and start to build that profile and then create a series of questions around that profile that help you kind of ferret out who you're looking for through the candidate process. So if you were advising a business, for you, what's the right interview structure? What's worked best for you? In terms of um, the the path on the interview or the actual interview itself? Not the interview itself. I think the if you had to chop it up and say, you know, what I would like to see every process be, whatever process that might be, mm -hmm. this is the ideal one I'd like to see happen. Okay, so the or first, is that very per industry? No, I, I think, I, no, I don't think it varies per industry. I think what you have to do is there is certainly things that are germane to a particular um, vertical or to a particular dealership organization or dealership. But I, I honestly believe that what you have to do is start with the end in mind, as Covey used to say, right? Who is it that we're looking to bring into the organization? Let's build a profile. Second thing we want to do, pardon me, is we want to be recruiting 365 days a year, not just when we need somebody. So we yes. catch somebody when they're at high noon. The amazing thing that I see very often is I get a lot of the panic phone calls. Sandy, we need to hire seven salespeople <laughs> yesterday. And it's then like, you really sell yourself on everybody's job. Hundred percent. Yes. You know, and, and none of us are magicians. That's right. I mean, I don't, you know, show up in a, a top hat and tails and, and wave a magic wand and we've got seven productive people there. Uh, so I like to see 24-7, 365 uh, recruiting and then have a plan to bring them into the organization the right way. You know, so often we see the old, you know, here's a pen, here's a desk, good luck. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm exaggerating to make the point, but... There is a uh, epidemic lack of onboarding, professional onboarding uh, in the dealership world these days. And I want to see dealers commit to putting together a process that makes people feel comfortable and confident as quickly as possible. So, you know, I've told you my story and this reminds me of it. I spent two years doing nothing but studying selling tapes. This is back in the VH, sure, VHS absolutely. days. Selling tapes about how to sell cars. Mm -hmm. Every lunch break, as I was working in the back as a lot boy, right? Two straight years. So start selling cars. I've got no onboarding experience. Right. None. They literally gave me the desk and said, all right, just go wait on people. There was an onboarding process, but it was being run by the five-car salesperson on the showroom floor <laughs> yeah. who was busy smoking a cigarette telling me all the reasons why you weren't going to make it. In this That's right. And I'll tell you, uh, I was scared to death. And I thought, going in, I thought, ah, oh, I'm going to kill this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had no idea what I was doing. Everybody has a plan until they've got to open their mouth and talk to a customer. That's right. Yeah. So, all right. So, what would you say number, rule number two? Rule number two. So, um, we're going to come up with three. 
And if you do these three, so you, right now we've got people matter most. You're finding the right people. Mm-hmm. We discuss that. What's the second one? Second one is something I borrowed along the way, and it's don't blame the untrained. Uh, I can't tell you who I borrowed it from. I will just say whoever came up with uh, don't blame the untrained was um, uh, an, a genius in terms of simplifying the articulation of the problem, right, yeah. which is uh, prepare people. You know, there are there are ways to develop learning tracks within your organization. It's personal and professional development, getting people that are A, open to it, and then B, just like yourself, committed to becoming better and understanding that it's not just about knowing your product. It's knowing people. It's knowing how to connect with people. It's knowing how to identify and listen to what it is that's driven them in there in the first place. Um, you and I have talked a lot about where people are these days in terms of the purchase decision funnel. They're so much lower down in the funnel these days by the time they get to the showroom floor that they're much better educated. If we ask them the questions and teach folks how to interview more effectively with their prospects, we get all the answers that we need. Instead, what we have are a lot of people pointing and saying, it's got this, it's got that, it's got this, it's got that, it's got this, it's got that. And they think they're doing a great job. So level setting expectations in terms of what a good job really is and giving them the training and development tools uh, that will help them get there, I think, is rule number two. Well, let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about that because I think one of the biggest mistakes I know in the auto, the auto industry makes, but I, I'm confident that just about every industry makes, is that we think we can train somebody and they went through training. They're good. They're good to go. And usually it takes on average someone seven times to hear something before it actually sticks. Absolutely. And so let's talk about the ongoing training or development, you know, how we're going to elevate our team, right? And in your opinion, what's that process or that structure look like? Because to me, the goal is how do we get these people, how do we get it to be retained, right? So they just don't hear something once, use 10% of it, and then that's it. I'm, I'm going to lay it on you in one line right now. The mother of retention is repetition. No. Um, and I see too often where uh, training and development gets pushed to the side when something more urgent and important presents itself. Um, and that could take the shape of a number of different things. It could be there was an accident on the lot. You know, somebody didn't show up. Um, you know, uh, uh, a delivery that went wrong. I mean, there could be any number of things inside of a dealership day that can, uh, you know, cast training and development to the side and and make it less and less important. Uh, Making that commitment to every single day, having someone in front of your people working on them and with them so that you can develop them over a period of time, uh, you get a little bit better each and every day by doing that. But you got to make that commitment. Yep. What would you say rule number three is? Rule number three is accountability. Um, I, I would yeah. I would say to you that it is um, it is perhaps outside of identifying and nurturing your culture effectively uh, the most important thing that you do every single day and that's hold yourself and your people accountable and and I start with the dealer principal and the GM and the management team is the way that they're holding themselves accountable is by holding other people accountable uh, you know a lot of times I'll hear. GMs, even dealer principals or managers complain about the fact that we can't get our salespeople to do this or F&I managers won't do that. That's a common thing. It it is a common thing. And my response is really simple. And I learned this from Jim Ziegler, the great Jim Ziegler, is that it's a symptom of lazy management or weak management. Uh, And that's not to cast an inspiration uh, or indict uh, the, the management on a whole. But the fact of the matter is, is that if you care enough about your people, and and you really believe that they matter, you're going to hold them accountable because by doing that, you in turn make them better at what they're doing. And they in turn now start to adopt that higher level accountability for themselves. We talked uh, a couple weeks ago with Rob Ruth from Mm -hmm. Bob Ruth Ford. Outstanding job they're doing there. 100%. And a lot of what they're doing, uh, it was a different theme, it was a different way to differentiate, but it was hard to keep it in that lane because everything wanted to go to his culture and the team he had built and how he elevated his people. But the number one thing when I asked him why he was so successful at that is he came back to what you just said. And that is that he truly cares about every single person that Mm -hmm. he works with, you know, and he brought up a good point. I don't, and I, I'll let you talk about this more is that that is not something you can fake. In other words, that gets seen through. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, the gut, 
the gut will tell you if it's legit and genuine. Yeah. Um, it's funny because I'm working with a, a young guy right now by the name of George Velarde, who's one of our mutual clients, yeah. BMW of Ramsey. Yeah. Um, and there's just something about George. I'm, I'm working with him on a one-on-one basis. Um, and, and I reached out to him. He didn't come to me. I reached out to him because I had seen him recently at the dealership. And I said, hey, how was August? And he kind of grimaced a little bit. He says, I only did 14. I said, okay, why? He said, ah, you know, I lost a little bit of focus. And I said, Georgie, I want to work with you. Would you be willing to work with me? But here's what so we're going to do. So this is an actual salesperson. This is an actual yes. salesperson, okay. right? Yep. And I said, I'm going to work with you because I believe you have the talent and skill to be a 30, 40, 50 car a month sales professional or client advisor in the BMW world. But there are some things that you're going to have to commit to and do and change about your behavior that's going to help get you there. And so we now talk every single day. And the only reason that we talk every single day is because I want to hold him accountable and myself accountable for the commitment that I've made to him. And so, um, you know, when I see managers out there that tell me how much they care about their people, but don't show that care and that um, level of commitment to their people and their actions, people see right through it. I'm going to ask this question because I, I think I know the answer, but I think it also can help people that there are a lot of business leaders out there who'd like to care, who mm-hmm. want to care. And I, I don't want to say that they don't, but struggle demonstrating it mm-hmm. where it doesn't matter if they care or not, if, if, if the employees don't believe it. Mm-hmm. Right. What have you learned or how is it benefiting you helping this, this salesperson? You personally. Well, that's a that's a great question. So um, it's funny. I'm listening to the man GC, Uncle G. Yeah. Grant. And he was talking about the fact that when he struggled uh, selling, the first thing he did was go help somebody else. And he said, for some reason, that just had like a magical impact or an effect on his performance. Um, I have a little bit different take on it. For me, I enjoy seeing someone else succeed and having some small hand in helping them get there. And when I saw the look on George's face uh, when he told me that he had done 14 cars, which, by the way, in many dealerships, there's a lot of That's folks above who are very happy That's right. with 14 BMWs retailed throughout the course of the month. <laughs> That's right. And, um, and when I saw him grimace, I said, he wants more. I need to show him how to do that. I need to spend some time with him. And what's in it for me, quite honestly, the whiff him for Sandy Cerami is I want to wake up at the end of December this year and have him have averaged... 20 deliveries per month between now and the end of the year. What have you personally taken away and learned from this experience, though? In other words, what can you, if you were to sit back and say, you know what, if I had not done this, I'm not talking about money. I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm talking about the stuff between your ears, right? Yeah. What, what have you taken away from this that, whether it helps you with the next person or the next business that you're helping, what, what is, where's the benefit for you there? Um, the benefit for me is, is a relevant, recent, first hand example of just dedicating small but quality amounts of time each day yep. to helping somebody succeed and then seeing the end result. So that when I have a conversation with a GM or a sales manager, I can reference something that is relevant and recent and talk about that as a success story with them. So I, I've been doing these podcasts now, and obviously when I started, you know, I've got my my own selfish oh, yeah. interest for, <laughs> for wanting to start this show, right? And But... It started because I truly want to help other business leaders and I, because I understand the importance of differentiating themselves. Mm-hmm. And I also see this train just rolling down this, this track full steam ahead and really painting a lot of people into this, what I call a commodity corner. Yeah. What I did not realize what happened with me is, first off, I'm inter- interviewing great people. Yeah. Sharp minds. Yeah, no question. I did not, I did not anticipate or uh, realize how much it was going to help me. Yeah. Well, let me say this to you. You and I had a conversation probably, it was either just before 10X or just after 10X. I don't recall. Yeah. And I, I just started the podcast. I had said to you, I want you to come do the podcast. You agreed to do it graciously. I appreciate it. Um, but you had, had articulated to me at that point in time that, that you had plans to do a podcast and that, uh, you were in the process of figuring out how to um, make it about the business in general and not about you. That was very important to you, that you yep. wanted to really be um, a beacon of uh, information in a way that it was going to help 
people that serve this industry or that you serve in this industry. And so I know that what you say is genuine and true. Uh, it's amazing what happens when we just start to kind of take off some of the inhibitions and go for it. Yeah. You know? And and I'm interviewing people outside of auto. And the okay. reason I do that is uh, – and, and so I've interviewed three people so far specifically – uh, coming straight from the dealership, right? right? You're helping that industry yep. and, and, and consulting with them. I've interviewed other business leaders local here because I believe sometimes when we are being <clears throat> commoditized or marginalized, that the answer that we have is right in front of us. Yep. But it's usually in another industry. And there are so many things that could be common in one industry that when you apply them... Uh, to a different industry, it can have huge and Im- almost immediate impact. No question about it. Where we're sitting is a great example. So we're in Louisville, and there are, gosh, I don't even know how many distilleries there are. Let's use a they, big number. Lots. Yes, <laughs> lots. They all do tours. That's right. common. What separates me from choosing where I'm going to go and do my tour? So. Evan Williams is always one of the places I tour. Right. Uh, we interviewed uh, Corky Taylor at, at uh, Kentucky Peerless Distilling. Mm-hmm. We always, well, when I have an out of town guest, I always choose these locations because the tour is best. Yeah. Their story is best. And so there were things that we learn outside this industry that I think applied, whether it's to auto or other, other industries. When you buy wine, have you ever went to, to Napa or wine country sure, or anything like that? Yeah. Did you sign up for any of the programs? Uh, no. I, when I, the last time I was out there was with my wife, and so she had the handcuffs on me because <laughs> I could tend to get a little bit out of control. But but I know where you're going. When they tell their story, you get you you, you get bought in, no right? Doubt. And you can't help. I had a, a, a private wine thing at our house, and it was from a, a a guy rewarding us for being part of his thing out in, in uh, Napa. He comes in, he says, I'll, I'll host this at your house. I'll bring all the wine. So we're like, yeah, sure. Right. right. We had seven couples there. Four of them do not drink wine. They're all part of the wine club. Amazing, right? His story was that incredible. That's it. Yeah. And so when we do this tour here, all right, first off, the tour here is awesome. So hopefully if we get done shooting this in time, we're going we're gonna to go do okay. that. But let's get back on focus. But... The reason I wanted to to talk about that is when when you're sitting here talking about caring enough and this and that, mm-hmm. um, and we got kind of sidetracked with with going off, but I thought it was a good conversation mm-hmm. in, in terms of, of what it brought. But what would you say is the biggest mistake that creates a lot of mental stress and anxiety for business leaders, specific to their culture? Uh, they don't spend enough time vetting candidates. And so, therefore, we end up with some problem children. We end up with people that um, maybe just aren't the right fit culturally uh, by no fault of anybody's. I would say that causes a lot of anxiety. There's no question about it because what I tend to see is that um, so-and-so is never going to make it. You know, the funny thing is I always reference, you know, watching your uh, infant or your toddler learn how to walk. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, my buddy Vin Lamanti is going to laugh when I say this because he used to talk about this all the time. Uh, you know, after the first two or three steps when they fall down, do we just like throw our hands up in the air and say, well, that one's not a walker and turn our back on them and walk away? No, we, we go over, we lift them up and we give them a chance to kind of, you know, get their feet underneath them. Uh, I think the biggest mistake that we make is, is bringing in the wrong people very often and then not making a strong enough commitment to them early on yeah. to help them gain their footing underneath them. And there's so many easy ways to do that, by the way. Um, you know, and we've got, you know, we've got something we're going to talk about later on uh, that, that does address mm-hmm. not only, you know, finding the right people, bringing them into the organization the right way, but continually training and developing them over a long period of time. That solves this problem, but it takes commitment and discipline and accountability in order for it to work. It's a great analogy. I, you know, a lot of people listening, they don't know that my son, Zach, who he's videoing and, and oh, recording man. all this. Yep. But it brought me back to that. I mean, there were times I wanted to give up on him walking, but after three <laughs> or four years, he finally got it. Well, he said the same thing about you last Friday night <laughs> yeah. at one of the bourbon events. He said yeah. he was going to give up on you at about 1130 that night. <laughs> you know? So, all right. So, touche, me... Zach. <laughs> what do you think? What do you think the biggest rule you ever broke as a business leader 
when it came to what's the biggest rule you've ever broken, right, as uh-huh. a business leader when it comes to building a winning culture, and how did you fix it or recover from it? Wow. Okay. There's probably a lot of them. I break. Oh a lot my of goodness, them. plenty. I, I want to think of something that's recent and relevant. Um, I'll tell you what. I'm not going to name the client. I I said yes to a consulting uh, engagement uh, about coming up on four years ago with a client that I knew damn well within the first half an hour of sitting with them that it was probably not going to be a good fit. And Why? Why? Be, truthfully, because I didn't believe that they cared about the people uh, over and above just pure profits. Yeah. And... Um, and I knew that the commitment level was not sincere, although I was being told that it was. And and I broke the rule of trusting my gut. I, I usually go with my gut. If I feel as though it's a good fit, I can't take every engagement because I, I truthfully, selfishly, I want to be successful on every damn one of them. Right. And um, the truth of the matter is, is that I ended up having to uh, walk away, mutually agreed upon, walked away 90 days into that engagement because we just weren't making any progress. Well, and you touched on something. You didn't feel in your gut that this person cared enough. Nope. And this goes back to what we kind of touched on early, and that was this. You cannot – so we're sitting here talking. This whole show, really, this episode is about manufacturing a culture. Mm-hmm. But realistically, that can't happen. Nope. There are rules you have to follow. Correct. But it can't be manufactured – If you don't care enough. And this is a good example because every business leader wants to improve their culture, Mm -hmm. right? They all want the morale of their their team to be high and everybody rowing in the same direction and everyone's bought in. But the reality is they're not always willing to really do. So that would, to me, that's an example of someone trying to manufacture a culture in a way that can't be done. Yeah, in a way. I I think it was as much that as it was just... um, they wanted someone to come in and do the work that they were not willing to do themselves. And it requires, it requires effort. It requires engagement, true engagement on the part of the leadership in an organization. Um, I mean, Scott, look, I, I walked away from the remaining six months on a contract. I could have gone and just worked my way through mm-hmm. and literally just gone through the motions and cashed a check. I, I just did, wouldn't have felt good about myself. And truthfully, I wouldn't have been able to walk into that dealership and look people in the eye each and every time that I went in there uh, and felt good about myself. And so I thought it was critically important to be honest, not only with myself, but to be honest with that client as well. So a lot of business leaders out there were notorious for looking for quick fixes. Mm -hmm. Where's that quick template that I can just apply and it'll work, right? So what do you think or or what are business leaders most likely to overpay and just have the money sucked out of their pocket hoping for some quick fix? So... Uh, wow, well, I want to be especially I, when it relates to talking about culture. Here, culture, right? in terms of, yeah. of uh, you know, putting your team together and growing your business. Because the truth is, everybody wants scale, they want sustainability, they want profitability, right? That's what they're looking for as a business owner. Um, those things don't happen overnight. This is not just you know, plant the seeds, add water, and in three weeks you've got a beautiful plant uh, that's grown. It doesn't work that way. I think there's a lot of um, hit and run artists out there right now that will come in and promise, you know, we're going to hire you, you know, uh, 10 salespeople and two are going to stick. And of the two that stick, you know, one year later, one will be there, but there'll be a good one. Yep. And dealers are quick to fork over the money for that. Um, And I don't mean to disparage that business model. I know that there are some that work it the right way and are very successful at it. Um, But I adopt a completely different uh, approach and I, I want it to be something that's not only sustainable, but it's got to be scalable and duplicatable. And that is not a duplicatable model in my book. Right. A duplicatable model is based on... What's duplicatable? It's just never ending. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, No question. That's such a great way of putting it. So, you know, you're constantly like the hamster on the treadmill and going through people, you know, constantly going through people. That doesn't build um, a level of loyalty and affinity to your organization. Um, but when you start to see leaders emerge from within your team that don't have the title of manager... Then you know you've gotten something going on the sustainable culture side of things, and and that's why I think it's critically important to bring in people. They don't, I don't we don't want the Stepford salespeople. I'm not looking for robots, but what I'm looking what I'm looking for are people that align with what's important to us organizationally in our culture. 
And when you start to see that happen, that becomes scalable and duplicatable, not just constantly uh, you know, repeating the same steps over and over and over again, looking for a different result, which is the definition of insanity, right. which is what we see on a regular basis. Business leaders want re results right now. Mm -hmm. you know? Where do you see them rushing in too quick in certain s situations on this topic or in this area where you said you, sh you would advise them for this this type of thing right here, slow down a little bit. Um, I, I am, my belly is full of the next great digital solution that comes along. Yep. I see dealers investing ungodly amounts of money on the greatest piece of technology ever invented, yep. which turns out to be a great piece of technology that doesn't ever get utilized at scale because there's not enough training or commitment to training in order to leverage that piece of technology. So that, that brings up a great thing. And, and People out there might be listening, thinking, well, how does that apply to culture? So it definitely impacts the culture. Absolutely. So, you know, here, here you are, new business owner, right, or a business owner, business leader, and you got, you're buying some type of new tool, <laughs> new technology, whatever it might be. The tool du jour. And to you, because you made the decision on buying it, right, it's the greatest thing in the world. To, to everyone, to you, but not to everyone that actually has to use it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so... That's great advice, actually. It's top-down decision making, and yeah. um, and it's it's almost one hundred percent antithetical to what should happen. There's not one person listening to this that hasn't done that and, um, I, and regretted those decisions. Every one of us has. Yes. If you own a business or have run a business, you have done that. And if you lie about that, you lie about other things too. Okay, <laughs> that's right. But the truth of the matter is, is that we should be when we're making a decision like that, where we're going to commit to a, a one year, a three year, a five year contract. That's five, six, seven figures, we should be soliciting the input of the people that are going to be utilizing that technology on a daily basis. And why don't we ask them, hey, what are the two or three biggest challenges you face in terms of achieving this result? Well, not only that, but a lot of technology or, or companies will let you pilot programs. You can actually sure. see how it works and how it integrates yeah. well with it and brings up questions that can either be easily answered or if it's the wrong fit, then it's not something no you want to sell about anyways. It. No question So about it. what are some of the things you think business leaders refuse to face? They want to get, basically they bury their face in the sand and just hope something goes away. You ever read reviews? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, we want to we want to buy the pill that we could take that makes the bad reviews go away. And if you're a commodity, you're more than likely there's some type of online reviews happening with your, your business, Every one right? of us is subject to them. Every one of us. Um you know, I, I always like to say, like, the cure for uh, epidemic poor reviews or um, the cure for epidemic challenges in your business lies in your people, lies in your processes. Um, you said before the answers are very much in front of us very often. Yeah. That's the truth. You know, we it's seek there. solutions from the outside. Keep your eyes open. the truth open. of the matter is, is we need an internist to come in and work on the inside of our business, not from the outside in, but from the inside out to solve these challenges. Is there anything that you'd like to share that we haven't covered as it relates to building a winning culture? No, I, I, I would say this, that there are so many resources out there. I have, I have am I allowed to use a four letter word on this uh, podcast? I think so. I, so probably it would, it would, I think it would increase our audience. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a hashtag that I used. I started using it with my kids because they would ask me questions and I want them to seek the knowledge and seek the answers that they uh, want on their own very often. So they would ask me questions and I'd say, hey man, go Google that shit, okay? You got a phone that we pay for, go Google it. If you want the answer, I'm sure there's an answer out there, just Google the question that you have. And so I think, you know, the one thing I want people to understand is there's so many different resources out there, whether it's YouTube, Google, a great book, a great audio program, an incredible podcast that has some of the answers or at least has the thread that you can pull on and keep pulling on. Sometimes you just need a starting point. That's it. You just need a little inspiration, yeah. a little motivation, and you need somebody to point you in the right direction. And then you got to do the do. Yeah. All right. As my buddy Joe Barricotta says all the time, like there's no substitute for doing the do. Action kills the fear, right? Yeah. Taking action kills the fear of what if, oh, well, if only this would, no, no, just go do it. If you screw it up, you can course correct. It doesn't mean it's a failure. You just got to course correct. And I think the, having the courage to go out there and take that first step is critical. Right. Well, I want to sh shoot out a, a big thank you to you for doing this interview. Thank you, it buddy. I appreciate it. Thank you. Outstanding. And I am confident that 
the business leaders who are listening to this will walk away with some better suggestions, ideas, and better game plan of what they have to do moving so. forward to build. So I want you to tell us a little bit before we end. I want you to tell us a little bit more about your trademark. It's a blueprint mm-hmm. on how to create a, a killer culture. Yeah, no doubt. All right. So why don't you tell us a little bit about well, that? Look, you know, it, it, killer culture is what we're all looking for. Problem is what we have out there are culture killers. So we're looking to just spin that, create the inverse uh, scenario. And, you know, what we talk about in, in the killer culture blueprint is making sure that we're looking for the right people for our organization, identifying what it is that we want to be about. Like, what are the two or three things that will adequately and, and um, effectively articulate who it is that we are so that we seek the right people and they seek us ultimately? Uh, it has a, a piece on there that, that teaches uh, a dealership how to onboard properly. Oh, how to bring great. people into the organization the right way. Uh, ultimately, teach so it them. So walks them through this. Walks them through that process. Walks them through a training and development calendar. A lot of times what I see is that general managers and sales managers say, well, I just don't have the time. We've got a, a proven formula with respect to a calendar that can work in any dealership. All right? doesn't make a difference what the brand is, what location it's in. doesn't matter. And then ultimately, uh, there's a piece in there that focuses on accountability and why it's so important and why it's not a four-letter word and why people won't resent accountability. As a matter of fact, they crave it. There's a thirst and an appetite for it. And I I would add, because you add auto into that, if you're not in auto and you're listening to this, I still suggest you, you, uh, and I'm going to show you where to go to get this, but I would suggest you still go and download this because some of the best ideas I have for the verticals I've been in, like we said earlier, did not come from the people inside that that lane. Yeah, no question. It comes from out. To that point, Scott, I, I've worked with uh, ESPN Radio in New York. I've worked with Cablevision. I've worked with Merchants Insurance Group. So it doesn't make a difference whether it's automotive or non-automotive. Business is business and business is people. That's right. And that's what we're talking about here. So, yeah. Well, thank you very much for sharing your experience and your expertise. Uh, well done. I appreciate it, buddy. Thank you. So, yeah, cheers. Yes. Cheers. And thanks to Evan Williams and to Zach. <laughs>